everybody for coming tonight. Um, um, I'm going to share my screen. Um, there's about 35 of you here now. So how about we, if you want to ask me any questions, go ahead and interrupt me during the talk. Um, if it's pertinent to whatever it is that I'm talking about. Um, if that gets to slowing us down too much, then we can hold it off to the end. But um, we can make this more of a discussion. I prefer that most of the time. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, so thank you again very much for coming. Um, I am Courtney. I um, am the primary biologist at Fila Day Conservation Fund. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself first. Um, so I am from Central California, um, grew up in Stockton and in the Sierra foothills, um, then moved to Davis for undergraduate, uh, then moved out of the area um, for graduate work um, in Tampa, Florida, and then in South Africa for two years. And um, I joined Fila Day in 2016. So about four and a half years I've been there now. And Fila Day's mission is um, really to, to strengthen wild cat populations and using um, multiple approaches um, to do that. We have a pretty small team. Um, Zara McDonald is our founder and president. Um, Ginger Thompson is our executive director. Kat is our office manager and data wrangler and um, does everything. <laughs> and then Dave Stoner is the co-PI, which is the primary investigator. So he and I work together on the research projects. So, why does Fila Day focus on wild cats? Um, and there's really two main reasons. One is cats are really awesome. They're beautiful, they're adorable. Um, they are just very charismatic um, and people like them. So and the, the other reason is they are really important to the ecosystems that they inhabit, um, especially um, some of these larger cats like uh, pumas that we're going to talk about today, also tigers and snow leopards and so forth, they occupy this um, dual niche of being both a keystone species and an indicator species. Um, and a keystone species is one that really holds together an ecosystem. They really um, make all other parts of um, the ecosystem work. And we'll talk a little bit specifically about how pumas do that a little bit later. Um, and an indicator species is one that indicates the health of the ecosystem. Um, their absence indicates that something has gone wrong and that the ecosystem itself is probably not functioning optimally. Okay, and then we're going to move specifically into Fila Day's flagship research project. So Fila Day is this um, kind of broad umbrella organization working on lots of different cats. Um, but Zara, our um, president and founder, um, really saw the need to study cats locally um, at the time, or I guess we're still based in Mill Valley. Um, but nobody's been to the office in a while, as you can imagine. Um, I myself am based in Walnut Creek. Um, anyway, so the Bay Area Puma Project, we use BAP for short, and our website is BAP.org. Um, it was initially started in 2007 um, in the Santa Cruz Mountains, um, working alongside um, researchers at UC Santa Cruz. Um, with the mission of really conserving and understanding pumas and the wild habitats that they live in. So this is um, our study area. Um, we do all nine counties of the Bay Area, um, excluding Santa Cruz now. Um, 
the UC Santa Cruz has their own research project. So they, rather than duplicating efforts there, um, they are working primarily there and we're um, working elsewhere. So initially we were doing a lot of collaring of pumas and this gives a really great information about um, really fine scale movements. Um, it also makes it possible to analyze what they're eating um, because of the way that pumas hunt. They'll typically take down um, prey and come back to it multiple times. So having collars makes it possible to figure out where that location is and visit it to determine what they're eating. Um, but as you can imagine, it's a pretty invasive um, and expensive way to gather data. So um, we've decided to kind of shift our efforts to more non-invasive techniques. Um, and our primary way that we collect data now is with wildlife cameras or camera traps. Um, these are very similar to what have become really popular, the ring type cameras that are motion censored, um, but we put them out in wildlands, um, areas where we expect to detect wildlife and specifically wild cats like bobcats and pumas. Um, so these are motion sensors. They'll anytime something walks in front of the camera, it takes, um, ours are set to take three photographs because sometimes animals are moving really quickly and it um, is hard to um, figure out what they are from a single shot. But if you can see them kind of in motion, um, we can do that. And as you can imagine, we have about, usually between 100 and 140 of these camera traps out throughout the Bay Area at any given time, collecting you know, between one and hundreds of photos a day, um, depending on how much human traffic there is usually. Um, so we have a lot of photos to catalog at any one time. So we rely very heavily on volunteers and citizen scientists and interns to help us cataloging that data and um, many other um, roles from um, bookkeeping to data analysis. Okay, I so said we would get back to why it was, why it is that we think pumas are specifically important um, to study here in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, and to start with, I'll say, that pumas are frequently misidentified. Um, they are particularly, um, or frequently confused with bobcats, which we also have in the area. Um, the main difference between the two is the size. Um, pumas have a, are quite a bit larger and also have a, a long tail. Um, bobcats, on the other hand, are actually quite small. Um, so usually somewhere in the, you know, 12 to 25 pound range. Um, there's some up north that can get, you know, in the, the 30 to 35 pound range, but those are pretty unusual. Um, so they're frequently um, confused for one another, but um, sometimes um, people, well, I'll go into that in a minute, but on top of um, that, pumas have a lot of variety in their coat color and their size and their shape, um, going anywhere from like a really light um, blonde color to a reddish, um, like a light red to a really dark red. Excuse me, Courtney? Yeah. Joanne, would you um, tell us all the different names for a puma? Somebody asked that said, notice oh. that the slide said mountain lion. Yes, I will do that. That is my next slide. I guess I should rearrange those slides, but I'll talk about that in just a second. Um, so yeah, my last point on this slide is just that um, young pumas, uh, young puma cubs are actually born with spots. So as they get larger, they, um, they outgrow these spots, but they can, for a while look like they are spotted, which can make them easier to confuse with bobcats. Um, 
to answer your question, Pumas actually have the most names of any mammal. Um, there's over 40 different names in English alone. Um, and that's because they actually have one of the widest ranges of any mammal species going all the way from um, southern Canada down to the southern tip of South America. And um, as you can imagine, all of the indigenous people each had their own name for this cat. Um, and so there are a lot of anglicized versions of those names on top of the indigenous names. And we actually have a list. Um, this is a, on our website, an interactive map. So you can actually kind of hover over each of these dots to um, see where it's called in the different regions. So hopefully that answered your question. So I use the word puma to talk about these animals. Um, I do that because their Latin name is puma con color. Um, but yeah, you frequently hear them called mountain lions, cougars, um, panthers, Florida panthers specifically. Um, these are all the exact same species. So it gets very confusing and I'm sorry for that. So I'm gonna try to call them pumas throughout, but occasionally I also call them mountain lions. Brittany, can you take a question? Yes. So, Sorry, my screen with my screen sharing, I can't like see hand raised or anything. So yeah, just interrupt me. Okay. So when you were showing the prior um, slide with the, all the different images, yeah. Can you tell by looking at their facial features the way you can with uh, domesticated cats, male from female? You know how domesticated cats, the males have the puffier cheeks and the bigger heads. Right. Like a tomcat. Right. Yeah. Um, you cannot tell um, the sex. It is very difficult, especially on camera, um, to do that. So actually the, the skull of a puma grows, uh, you know, very little, but throughout their entire life. So you actually, it's a better indicator of age than it is sex for pumas. Um, so, and on top of that, they're, female pumas tend to be slightly smaller than males, but they overlap tremendously. So a female puma will usually be somewhere in like 70 to 120 pound range and males are like 80 to 150 pound range. So it's very hard to, to distinguish them based on um, pictures of them. Did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Great. Okay, so I really wanted to include some sounds of pumas in this talk, but I just like couldn't get the IT to work out for me. So I highly recommend, you know, jumping on YouTube and listening to some sounds. Pumas are technically small cats um, as opposed to big cats, which are like tigers, snow leopards, lions that make this really loud roaring sound. Pumas are the largest small cat. Um, and one of the main differences is this bone in their throat called a hyoid bone. In small cats, it's ossified. So that means it's completely bony. Um, whereas in big cats, it's soft. And that difference allows for the differences in the vocalization. So pumas do not roar. They make a ton of other cool sounds um, from like a really high pitched chirp that sounds like a bird. Um, they scream, um, they meow like a house cat, I've heard it. Um, they purr and they'll growl. Um, but a lot of times when people say they heard a, a lion, a mountain lion roar in their backyard, um, it ends up being a gray fox. So I also recommend looking at YouTube and listening to a gray fox sound. They sound really scary <laughs> um, for how little they are. So a lot of times that's um, one point of confusion. Also deer in rut can make a really, a sound that sounds very similar to a roar. So also worth looking up. It's, there's some cool sounds and I wish I could have included them here. 
Okay. Um, so benefits to the ecosystem, as you can imagine, because pumas play this really important keystone and indicator species role, um, they have big effects on the ecosystems where they live. And you guys might be, are probably familiar with um, gray wolf Yellowstone situation where um, for a long time, gray wolves weren't present in Yellowstone and the ecosystem became really degraded. Um, and then when they returned wolves to the ecosystem, they saw these huge changes, like even changes in the shape of the rivers there because previously the elk had eaten all of the grassland, all of the, the vegetation that held banks together. And when wolves came in and got elk populations under control, um, that vegetation was allowed to regrow and it changed the shape of the river. So these are like really big, um, even just environmental effects. And pumas do this same thing here. Um, I mean, if you've been in an area that's devoid of pumas, you've probably noticed the, the lack of understory vegetation because mule deer come in and just decimate it. Um, and that means that there's not only differences in um, hydrology, like how the water moves through the system, but it means that there's, um, you know, less food for um, caterpillars, for less um, hiding places for birds and small rodents and things like that. So all of these things are affected just because of Puma's presence or absence or, um, and that sort of thing. And in that regard, we would consider Pumas something that are ecosystem engineers. They can actually like change um, the entire system itself. So for example, um, Pumas primarily prey on mule deer in this area. But like I mentioned earlier, they'll take um, down a prey and they'll come back to it sometimes over the course of a week. Um, of course, during that time, there's gonna be some breakdown of the carcass. And that means that there are little buggies that can get in there, um, soil microbes um, and invertebrates, and it changes the biodiversity um, underneath where that carcass is. Um, having more invertebrate diversity means there's more food for insectivores like birds and um, rodents, possums, that sort of thing. Um, it also means that there's a, a possibility for more plant diversity because there's more of these um, microbes change the microbiome of the soil and um, and allows for competition um, in different to happen in different ways, but even between plant species. And it's also food um, for um, scavengers like vultures and rodents. And we have this really cool video that I love to show. Um, this is a puma kill um, that we found. We put up a camera and this is actually a coyote and a bobcat <laughs> scavenging off of this puma kill. Um, so yeah, it's really interesting. I've, I love these um, interspecies dynamics, especially being able to get them on camera is very lucky. Um, Pumas also do this really interesting thing in that they keep prey populations healthy. So think about your house cat at home. If your house cat's anything like my house cat, my house cat is very lazy. Um, it will, my house cat doesn't even go after like bugs and things that it sees unless they're like already on their last leg. So Pumas are like this too. They prefer to take down prey that's injured or sick because it's just easier to do. Um, and when they remove sick prey, it means that that prey can't infect other individuals of the same species. And that in turn keeps the prey population healthy. It limits infectious disease in those populations. Um, and that's been explicitly shown for pumas and chronic wasting disease. Um, in, which is a really nasty um, 
disease like a scrapie or mad cow disease. Um, it's the same type of disease as that, but it affects um, mule deer in North America. Um, so kind of an interesting little, um, little known fact about pumas. Um, likewise, there's going to be um, explicit benefits for humans along the same lines. So um, taking down deer means that there is there are fewer deer ticks, which means that there's probably less Lyme disease in a system. So these um, control efforts in keeping nature in balance means less infectious disease over time for humans and for other wildlife. There's also really um, interesting work being done showing um, pumas controlling deer populations can um, decrease the amount of car collisions with deer. Um, in South Dakota, there's something, if pumas were re to return, um, to be returned to South Dakota, something like a hundred lives would be saved in like several million dollars in damages to cars, um, mm. just returning that species to its native habitat. And so that brings us to just why pumas in general, like there are other apex predators that can provide these services. I was talking about wolves in Yellowstone. The, the problem is that we don't have any more in California specifically. Um, we used to have wolves, we used to have grizzly bears. Those have both been extirpated except for that very small pack that's just returned into Lassen, Lassen and Shasta areas. Um, so it's really important that if we want our ecosystem in the Bay Area specifically to continue um, to work that we try to conserve pumas specifically um, because it will have an effect on the entire functioning of the ecosystem. Which brings me to my next point, like why should we be worried about them? So pumas, as I mentioned earlier, have one of the greatest, one of the largest home range extents of any mammal species, but they have been extirpated from about half of that over the last 250 years or so, especially um, in the early 1900s, there was um, a lot of campaigns to, to kill pumas specifically. Um, so that green area is where they are currently known to exist. Red is red plus green is where they um, historically have been over time. We are very excited though, because even though pumas aren't um, threatened as a species, the uh, California Department of Fish and Wildlife is considering um, granting pumas a threatened status in specific regions of California. And one of those regions is the San Francisco Bay Area. Hey, Courtney, we have a question in the chat about the meaning of the word extirpate. Extirpate means um, getting rid of uh, completely. Eliminated, yeah eliminated, gone. So extirpated means they do not exist in California. Um, extinct, I guess would be another word for it. Um, so I'm going to kind of go through some of the um, biggest reasons or the, the most frequent reasons we lose pumas in the Bay Area. Um, so in California, even though they're not listed as threatened, pumas are a specially protected species because they were threatened for a long period of time in um, the history of the state. Um, they're starting, their numbers are going up, which is in, in some areas of California, um, which is a reason, which is so worth celebrating. Um, but even, so because they have this specially uh, the special status with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, they're not legally allowed to be hunted in the state of California. It's the only state um, in the US where it's illegal to hunt pumas. However, there is a loophole with a um, what they call a depredation permit. So if someone 
um, loses a domestic animal, they can call Fish and Wildlife and ask for a depredation permit. Notice that you, depending on who your warden is in your area, um, the level of proof required to say it was a puma as opposed to a bobcat or a coyote or something else, um, it, it varies. So you may need to require a lot of proof that it was a puma, like photographic evidence, or you may have to require none to get one of these permits um, to, to shoot a lion. Does that include animal ag agriculture? Yes. Any, yeah, any domestic animal, including pets. So that's one major way is this kind of this legal killing of pumas in California. The other is poaching. So because it's illegal, a lot of people do it anyway. Um, and we call it the three S's, shoot, shovel, and shut up. So we know ranchers are doing that throughout the Bay Area. Um, ranchers that are worried about pumas um, taking cattle and other domestic animals. And then there's an awful lot of indirect human caused um, deaths of pumas. So automobile accidents um, in the Bay Area specifically, Highway 280 is a really bad corridor for mountain lions being hit by cars. Um, that Crystal Springs Reservoir just to the west of 280 is um, has a very strong, healthy population of pumas. Um, it might even be um, over carrying capacity there um, because of the geography. So lions will come up from um, the Santa Cruz mountains and go up the peninsula and then obviously hit the city and can't go anywhere else. And that Crystal Springs Reservoir is kind of that last green area on the peninsula. So there's, it's pretty dense in there. So as pumas try to disperse out of that region, a lot of times they're trying to cross one or 280. So we see a lot of accidents there specifically. Um, another reason is um, rodent poisons. So, and this is through um, something we call bioaccumulation. So what happens is somebody puts out some rodent poison in their garage. Um, it doesn't kill the rodents right away. So they'll go out um, you know, into a backyard or into a field to die, they get eaten by wildlife. Um, so, I mean, a, a raccoon eats two or three of these, a puma eats two or three raccoons, and you can see you have a whole lot of this rodent poison um, building up in the food chain. And the rodent poison itself doesn't seem to outright kill a lot of these um, higher trophic level species, but it does um, make them immunocompromised, which puts them at risk of infectious diseases. So um, Southern California just saw a huge population crash of bobcats and they suspect, well, they know that they are dying of mange, um, but mange has been in the system for as far back as anybody knew. Um, the problem is that they're all, they all have, uh, they're all immunocompromised because of rodent poisons and they're getting mange so bad that it kills them. So it's really sad down there. Um, but in those efforts, actually California just passed a law banning a lot of these types of rodent poisons. So it's worth looking in your own garages if you have them to see whether they're still legal to use. Um, and then the other- I'd like to ask a question. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so that chart there implies that cougars eat coyotes, is that true? They will, they'll eat, they'll, yeah, eat even bobcats and things. They don't do it frequently, um, but they, they will from time to time, yeah. Thanks. The only thing that I know of in the Bay Area <laughs> that I, that there's no evidence of them eating is feral pigs. Um, and my, there's no, not been any research about it, but my hunch would be that feral pigs are just really mean and not worth the effort. Um, so 
yeah, they'll eat pretty much everything else. Will they eat a wild turkey? Yes, they will. I have, we have some video evidence of it. Um, they will definitely. I, I, I wanted to. Back on until we switch. I, I wanted to import one because we were troubled by seven wild turkeys in a small <laughs> municipal <laughs> garden. Yeah, uh, um, pum pumas, bobcats, coyotes, gray mm. fox, they'll all eat them, so. Really? Yeah. They're pretty big. They can be, yeah, that's true. <laughs> they're <laughs> they're fluffier than they, or they look fluffier than they really are. Mm -hmm. um, they weigh 25 pounds. Yeah, that's true. Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, I mean, I've, I know bobcats and coyotes will also take down Deer, so they'll take down things that are quite a bit larger than themselves if they have the opportunity to do so. Mm -hmm. Just a note, uh, we recently were hiking in a fairly remote area near Pinoli Ridge and came across uh, two deer skeletons and what I'm now realizing was probably a turkey skeleton all in the same location. Mm. Hmm. So one interesting thing to know about pumas is they tend to wherever their kill is they'll they'll drag it to a hidden area but pumas have such huge home ranges so um at minimum like 30 square kilometers but usually closer to 100 square kilometers um they very rarely will take a kill in the exact same spot um and they don't have dens per se they don't have a place that they go home to every night because they're constantly walking around their home range and uh, watching for intruders and leaving scent marks to make sure everybody knows that that's their territory so this if there's like a pile of carcasses it's probably not a puma um unless this is like a really good easy place for a kill to happen um that the likelihood is is unusual. Yeah. Um, yeah I, have, I have pictures that I can share at some point if you want to yeah, see including sure. pictures of scale. Man, you wouldn't believe the kind of pictures I get emailed to me <laughs> on a regular basis. So a skeleton sounds pretty, pretty good. I get some gruesome and a lot of poop pictures. <laughs> um, Anyway, the last point I just wanted to make is habitat changes. So um, especially in the Bay Area, um, we're seeing obviously a lot of um, fragmentation of habitat. So that can be due to housing developments, roads, um, any kind of infrastructure. And pumas really like to be in forested areas, um, places with a lot of vegetative cover. Um, so when, but they also need a very large home range um, to, to be able to have enough food for themselves. So when there's this fragmentation occurs, um, an area either becomes uninhabitable by a puma or that puma has to track back and forth between or across whatever this um, caused this fragmentation. So crossing the highway a bunch of times or having to walk through a residential area. They're not, it's not technically part of their home range, but it's something that they have to travel through. So, um, you know, a lot of people are very worried when they see pumas in residential areas. A lot of times it's just, a way to get from point A to point B. Um, and the because they have such huge home ranges, the loss of one puma can really cause a, um, a lot of reshuffling of territories. So if the puma had a really good territory, then you might see other a bunch of puma other pumas trying to get in and claim that area as their own. Um, and pumas will fight to the death for a good territory. So this can cause a lot of um, a lot of issues within the greater population, just the loss of one puma. Um, also 
pumas stay with their moms for a really long time. So usually at, at bare minimum a year, um, usually it's usually around 18 months to two years. And in drought times, it can be as many as three years. Um, and they stay with their mom for that long because it, it's really hard to kill deer. So taking down a deer is, um, takes a lot of effort um, and a lot of knowledge. And mom, it takes mom somewhere usually around 18 months to teach her cub that. So when um, a mother is lost and a cub is abandoned, that puma can never be returned to the wild um, because they just don't have the education to be able to fend for themselves. Um, pumas that are, or uh, puma cubs are kittens that are older, um, say maybe they're 10 months old or 12 months old, but they haven't quite finished their education yet and they lose mom. Um, these pumas probably can fend for themselves, but they may not be as good at taking down deer as um, humans would want, let's say. Um, and they end up taking down easier prey items. So they're the ones that are gonna be taking your cats and your dogs and your sheep and things like that or tend to be these less educated pumas. Okay, so um, now I'm just gonna kind of briefly go through the, our, um, the different uh, programs that we have for Bay Area Puma Project and some of our research projects. Um, I'm running a little bit farther behind than I thought I was gonna do. So, but I'm okay continuing to talk at this pace if everybody else is okay, but just be aware. So one of our programs is a K through 12 education program. Um, we haven't been doing this as much in COVID times because we haven't um, converted everything online um, as quickly as we were hoping. But typically um, this would be a three part um, program where we would have a lecture and discussion with the kiddos, um, then a field trip where we would talk about how to set up a camera trap and um, work on print identification and things like that. Um, and then uh, also um, a lab that's uh, depending on age can vary from predator prey dynamics to you know, getting to touch different animal pelts depending on, um, on the age of the kiddos. Um, Outreach is a really important part of our work. Um, Pre-COVID times, we were doing a lot of in-person tabling and lectures. Um, now we've moved to webinars um, and really relying on our um, website to, as a way to get out information about Pumas in the Bay Area. And we also um, are starting to develop these community projects. So there are communities in the Bay Area that um, have kind of these mixed populations of people really interested in conservation, um, but also living with ranchers and, and figuring out how can we get these groups together to work together to conserve pumas when they have such um, different points of view. So that's something that we're also developing. Our research priorities are really um, learning about the health of pumas in the Bay Area, um, both the individuals and the populations. Uh, monitoring where activity is occurring and when, um, and using non-invasive techniques, primarily those camera traps. So completed research. So these in the last um, year or two, we've just published these. If you're interested in the actual scientific publications, shoot me an email um, and I'm happy to share those with you. But um, this was kind of the first research project I took on when I joined in 2016. Um, and it was going through all of our pictures of pumas and rating their body condition um, based on uh, fat deposition. So I ranked them on a one to nine scale. I know one to nine is kind of a dumb <laughs> scale, but it's what the um, zoos do for African lions as a one to nine scale. So I uh, based it off of that um, with one being extremely skinny and nine being 
obese. Um, so here's a, a three, a five, and a seven. These are all, well, actually this puma here on the bottom is an Argentinian puma um, that was caught by some colleagues or camera trap caught by colleagues. Uh, this number five here is from the Crystal Springs Reservoir in San Mateo County. And this guy, this number seven up here is actually from um, the like Oakland and Berkeley Hills. Um, he's, a, he's a big boy. And so my research question was looking at how these different, how body condition correlated with habitat type, natural um, marginally disturbed, which would be something like a park or a golf course or a cemetery or something like that. So it's a green space, um, but not fully natural. And then highly disturbed. And interestingly, the pumas that lived in marginally disturbed areas actually had the highest body condition scores. Um, and this was really exciting for us because it means that um, pumas in these like semi-disturbed areas, which a, a lot of the Bay Area would fall into that category, um, they can survive there and they can even thrive in those areas if given the opportunity to do so. Um, and we followed up on this and the reason for this um, pattern we think is there's just more food resources in this marginally disturbed habitat. So um, we have our natural on the left, marginally disturbed in the middle and highly disturbed on the right. And this is relative to each other. So um, this marginally disturbed category just had a lot more raccoons, squirrels and deer, um, probably because marginally disturbed habitats irrigate their um, areas a lot more. So there's just more food. Um, also sp specifically for raccoons, they eat a lot of garbage, which obviously would be a lot more present in this marginally disturbed versus the natural habitats. Hey, Courtney, there was a question in the chat from somebody who lives in San Anselmo who says he has lots of deer and wondered if uh, having lots of deer might indicate he has perhaps a puma in his neighborhood. So Actually, my guess would be um, the opposite. If you have a lot of deer, then especially if they're hanging around a lot, that means there's probably not a big predator in your area because they don't feel the need to move around and they're not scared. Um, San Anselmo specifically, <laughs> I know there's not a whole lot of activity there. It's definitely under carrying capacity in that area um, just because I know we have cameras out there. Um, but that being said, if you know you do have pumas and, you, and you're worried about them, um, trying to keep deer off your property or, or wherever you don't want pumas to come visit um, is a really um, useful way to, to control um, whether pumas come on your property or not. So keeping deer, sorry, that was very um, convoluted. Keeping deer off your property will keep pumas off your property. Um, so, sorry, moving on. So this, um, we, I talked a little bit earlier about the I-280 um, being a, a notorious um, roadkill hotspot. So we've done some um, specific research. Um, we were really interested in looking along this corridor, um, thinking about wildlife, future wildlife crossings. Um, Wildlife crossings, you probably are familiar with, um, they really just link to wildlife preserves um, and make a, a safe passageway. Um, so we were looking if this, if there were any hotspots along I-280 that might be a good place for that. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> we, we found that there are hotspots, but they, uh, they vary by species. So bobcats, bobcats are more likely to be killed in a certain area along I-280, and that's different than where deer are hit or where pumas are hit or where coyotes are hit. So each species seems to have their own crossing point or, or a few different crossing points um, along I-280. 
But there are some useful takeaways from the research we did, which is um, roadkill is a lot more likely to occur in October and November. So if you are driving along 280, being specifically aware um, if you're driving in during that time and watching for animals, this is um, frequently a time of dispersal. So a lot of young animals are born in the spring um, and then by October, November, they're looking for their own habitats. Um, also these um, urban areas, uh, the closer you, you are to an urban area, um, the more likely you are to encounter wildlife on the road, um, at least on the I-280. Um, and then the most recent study we completed was looking at ideal habitat for pumas in the Bay Area. So this research has been done for other puma populations, but the Bay Area is really interesting in its uh, geography and ecology and how fragmented a lot of the habitat is. So we wanted to know specifically in the Bay Area where what areas were most likely to have pumas um, and what, what the predictors of those habitats were. Um, so we looked at all sorts of things, um, amount of humans, the slope, the vegetative cover, um, prey abundance, um, prey diversity, all these sorts of things. And the only thing that was a really good predictor of whether pumas were there or not is forest cover. And so we kind of mapped out over the, the nine county Bay area where forest cover was the most dense. And, and these are the areas we would predict um, pumas um, most likely to occur. Okay, ongoing research. So I think we all had um, a learning curve in coping with all of the things that happened in 2020. <laughs> so we are also interested in how Pumas coped with 2020. And by that specifically, I mean um, the COVID lockdowns. So there are some other species that um, appear to have or that moved into urban areas like coyotes um, that during that COVID lockdown period. Um, interestingly, we did not see that same trend for pumas. Um, sightings did not increase um, during the lockdowns, but we also had to deal with wildfires last year. Um, and we did see an increase in anecdotal sightings. So we have a um, a map on our website where people can submit sightings um, from their backyards or on their hikes or whatever. And puma sightings did increase after the wildfires and, and that makes um, perfect sense, at least to me, they're, they're, they were likely moving away from wildfires and from dangerous levels of smoke. Uh, and we're still seeing the effects of that now as pumas, um, try to move back into those areas. And then at the same time, we're also still thinking about that last project that I was talking about with the um, predictions of where pumas are most likely to occur. When you look at the map, it's highly fragmented, uh, unsurprisingly. And some of these fragments are really small they're really isolated. Um, it, not all of these patches are created equal. So we've developed um, some follow-up analyses and, and studies um, to really dig in a little bit deeper here. So right now we're looking at which of these patches are actually being used by pumas. Um, with some hypotheses about, you know, smaller patches are probably less likely to be used. Patches that are more isolated are probably less likely to be used. Um, a small patch that's really close to a huge patch, that's probably usable. So we're doing those studies now, we're going into as many of these patches as we can get access to um, and confirming presence or absence of pumas in those areas. Um, this is a little map I just made 
last week of our different patches and where we have data. So dark purple is where we've already detected a puma. Um, light purple is where we have had cameras out and not detected a puma. Um, if you're, I'm in Walnut Creek, so if you're in the um, Eastern East Bay, like I am, um, you might be interested to see that the we have not detected a puma in the Diablo range, which um, is very strange to me, but um, we can't seem to, to detect any there. Um, and then this light um, colored green is where we have um, cameras out and we're trying to confirm absence or presence right now. Um, and what we wanna do with this data is really project out into the future. Okay, these areas are likely to be developed based on um, infra current infrastructure. Um, how can we, or what patches do we need to try to save now? Or what corridors do we need to start thinking about saving? Um, what kind of conservation easements do we need to think about now? Um, knowing that in the future, these patches may not be available or may become so small that they're unusable or may become so isolated that they're unusable by pumas and so forth. Um, yeah. Okay, so that's kind of our, our research and um, an overall program. Um, I'm just gonna wrap up now. It looks like I actually did all right with time. Um, so if you want more information, our BAP.org or FILADAFund.org are two um, websites, but we're also on Facebook and LinkedIn and Instagram and Twitter. Um, if you're interested in getting involved, um, we're always looking for volunteers to help in the field, um, especially for cataloging photos. Um, like I said, we get tens of thousands of images a month. So getting those cataloged is a bear. Um, it's actually pretty fun, um, depending on which camera you get to, you get some really cool wildlife pictures. Um, and it really helped me get to know the wildlife of the area, things that um, I didn't realize how many were out there. Um, and then if you personally have a sighting, Adding it to our sightings map on BAP.org is really helpful for our research as well. Um, and then I wanna just kind of conclude by saying thank you to all the volunteers that have helped us so far with our research. Um, it's, it would be impossible to do without them. And then this is like a, just a gratuitous cute Puma video that I love and have to show you. This is in the Crystal Springs Reservoir, a mama with three little bouncy kittens. That's one one way to tell. Sometimes people will think a house cat is a is a puma kitten, but puma kittens are so goofy. Um, <laughs> they they don't they don't move like like a cat just yet. Um, and then with that, um, if there are any questions that people saved to the end, I'm happy to take those now. Um, the screen also has my contact information um, down at the bottom, Courtney Kuhn at feelitafund.org. So if you want um, any follow-up information, if you have poop pictures you wanna send me, if, um, yeah, if you want any of the manuscripts, the publications I mentioned um, to read, happy to share any of those. Yeah, hey, Carrie. Uh, uh, Courtney, there's another question here in the chat from a citizen scientist who wants to know if you can recommend a camera trap for under $100 that they could use. Ooh, under $100. Usually the ones that um, we buy that we I like are the um, some of the Bushnell models and some of the Browning models, but they usually come in right around $100. Um, once you get your, your batteries and your SD cards and everything. Um, but those are the two we use most frequently, the, the economy models. If you wanna go big, um, I really like the Reconics are really great, but they're in like the $400 plus range. We don't have very many of those. <laughs> I have a question. I yeah. used to be a, a volunteer and I cataloged the photos and there was just such an overwhelming amount of photos. It seemed. <laughs> 
are there any technologies? There's so much um, artificial intelligence now to catalog like faces and things. Are there any technologies that recognize animals? Yes. So we are actually testing an AI right now just to help us clean out blanks, which was uh, it's going to save us a huge amount of times. Um, so because those cameras are motion censored, we get a lot of grass blowing or if you don't check the camera for four to six weeks in the springtime, something can grow right on top of your camera. Um, so we're using some AI to help clean those kind of blank photos out right now. Um, and we are working with some engineers right now to help us with just kind of um, picking out humans versus non-humans. And that will also save us a huge amount of time because yeah, you're right. If you get a set that's on a, high, a popular hiking trail, yo, it's got like 3000 pictures of humans and like, and a puma. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but it was really fun. So I do recommend looking into yeah. it. But those, so the, and and I know that they're, those sets with lots of humans are not as fun, but they're from a research point of view, just so, so interesting to see what species will share trails with that many humans. Um, the number of species is incredibly low, but pumas tend to be one of them, um, which I find just, fascinating um were you going to play some puma sounds no i couldn't get them to work on my um on this i really like this um presentation program it's called prezi um it's really pretty but i just couldn't get it to upload the sounds so yeah i reckon but i do highly recommend just jumping on youtube and um uh, searching for mountain lion sounds or puma sounds and also gray, gray fox sounds. Hmm. Wouldn't be hard to do. And you said gray foxes sound like they roar? Yeah. They sound very scary for how little they are. <laughs> <laughs> and, and oftentimes, if, especially if you hear two animals like kind of growling back and forth at each other it's um probably a gray fox they're chatting with each other that's hilarious they growl mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. any other questions do you have any camera traps in the uh point Reyes national seashore area we do. I think um, I'm not sure of the exact number that we have out right now. We typically have between 10 and 12 out at any one time. Um, we lost a few, unfortunately, in the fire. They had a, a, a small fire out there and we lost like two or three cameras in, the, in that little small fire up on the mountain. Um, and then we had one camera destroyed by someone. Um, so I think we're, we're down to maybe like seven or eight cameras out there right now. Any uh, estimate as to uh, what the uh, population of mountain lions uh, would be in the Point Reyes Golden Gate area of Marin? So that area is definitely under carrying capacity. Um, there is some activity um, out there right now. Um, when I started with Fila Day in 2016, um, they, there were a few pumas out in that area. Um, then around 2017, we stopped, we stopped getting any activity whatsoever. Uh, and then in late 2019, we started getting activity again in that region. So it seems to be blipping in and out um, whether there are any pumas there but there there is some out there at, at this moment yeah and and do you coordinate with uh the audubon society's uh, fellow from south africa that's been doing a lot of research in sonoma county yeah so um that's audubon canyon ranch they're actually technically not audubon yeah. society but um yeah we have worked with them his name is quinton um, um i did some 
I did my postdoc in South Africa, so we chatted a little bit. Um, they are doing mostly collaring type work and a lot of outreach in that area, which is awesome. Um, in order to not duplicate efforts, we tend to kind of have, they stay in the Mayakamas um, range in Sonoma. Um, and then we are um, working more in the Marin area. But yeah, there is some crosstalk there. Um, we actually have um, a group of um, camera trappers, um, like large scale tra camera trappers in the Bay Area um, meeting usually once a year, just to kind of talk about what we're seeing out there and, and share resources and things. Okay, thanks. I have a question. Um, do you do you think there are mountain lions in Point um, in Mount Tam? Mount Tam. Occasionally, we get we pick up some activity. So we actually um, one Tam has a really great camera trapping effort of their own. So um, we don't we don't have any camera traps up there at the moment because they're doing a lot of work. But they share their um, pictures when they have them with us. Um, yeah, so it doesn't seem like there's very much activity. Um, when I started back in 2016, we were getting activity and I haven't um, seen any recently. Um, I have a, a feeling that um, the 101 and um, uh, there's a whole lot of ag kind of going on between um, like Petaluma and um, mm. in like Northern or like a yeah, Northern Marin area. Um, I think that's kind of keeping a lot of um, movement of pumas back and forth. Um, those two kind of are, are working as barriers, but um, we just got a grant to put up some additional cameras in that area. Um, so we're hoping to, to investigate that a little bit further. Thanks. What can you say about uh, camera traps or pumas in uh, Pinole Ridge, Briones area? So we do not have any cameras out in that area. Um, the only ones we have out in East Bay are in Diablo. That being said, I um, maintain our sightings database. So what comes in through our BAP.org. Um, we do get occasional um, reports of sightings out that way, but I have not seen a, a, a ver what we would call like a verifiable sighting. So a picture of a puma um, out there for several years. Um, but I know East Bay Regional Parks has some of their own camera trapping that they do. I don't know if they do it in Briones or not, um, but it might be worth, if you're um, super interested, getting in touch with them. I haven't heard anything come from them in a while about it, but um, I haven't asked this explicitly either. Thank you. Anybody else? I think that's it. You're getting applause in the chat box here. <laughs> Mon, yes, I have a question. The Pleasant and Dublin uh, Ridge area, uh, any Puma sighted? So I am looking for data from that area. <laughs> I um, have not got any verified sightings from that area. The furthest south in the East Bay is San Ramon that I've gotten verifiable sightings. There's some ranches out that way, um, yeah. west of uh, 680. Mm -hmm. And then they seem to stop um, in like Southern Pleasanton. So like where Henry Coe Park and the Sunol um, wilderness area are, we get reports in there, but I, I can't find any evidence of them in between those areas. Um, I've been reaching out to Livermore Parks and Pleasanton Parks and they don't have any evidence that they're in that area either. So I'm very interested to know because it seems like it's good habitat, at least partially. Um, but yeah, same with uh, the Diablo range um, where it's good habitat, but 
we're not mm-hmm. detecting them out that way. So if they are there, they're very rare. I have about a 12 inch diameter um, pear tree in my front yard in um, uh, November, it, it got a tremendous number of uh, scratches on it where the bark was peeled. And uh, my wife thought it was deer horn, but I'm wondering if do the, do the pumas do any scratching of, of tree bark? Not typically. They will, they will occasionally um, scent mark something. My guess is you have raccoons trying to scramble up your tree and eat your pears. Um, no, no, but, this was, it's, it's actually a fruitless pear. So, oh, is it? Okay. They weren't, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, they, they will not typically um, scratch into, into bark um, okay. like that. They, they will occasionally, but it's not something they do frequently. Um, they, the way that they typically scent mark is um, with just just straight rubbing on branches or um, with urine and feces, urine. they'll mm-hmm. create little little mounds. Right. Okay. You did a very good job. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Courtney. This was really, really interesting. Great. What? Happy to do it. The other question, when you were in Pretoria, did you uh, work with any cat species in, in Africa? Actually, in I was working, working with bovids when I was oh, there. Okay. I was working with Cape buffalo and domestic uh-huh. cattle and looking at infectious diseases going back and forth between Kruger National Park. Hmm. Okay. I have a question. It's kind of random. Oh, I guess you can't see me. Um, when I was in Thailand or Laos, or I mean, this has nothing to do with mountain lions, but it's a big cat thing. They have a whole tourist thing where it's set up that you go and you get your take your picture laying all over this tiger who, for some reason, doesn't kill and eat you. you know what's <laughs> up with that? I mean, have you ever heard of that, or you know what I'm talking about? I mean, I yeah, I mean, I've heard of things like that. Um, I mean, if you've watched like Tiger King and that sort of thing. Um, right. Kind of like cat, that. Yeah. So like cats, um, cats are cats. So like they can be friendly and you, there's a lot of variation in, um, uh, domestic, domesticate ability, like how, how domestic they act and, and how much they want to be around you. And there's just like a lot of variation between individuals about that. Um, but I would never trust a cat 100% for anything. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's a whole big industry there. Yeah. Well, before anybody else, um, ha- 